The Maritime Coast, a source of pride that enables so much of what we do. Here, we haul in our fishing traps and harvest both on land and in the water. Industries operate along the shores and many government offices are located in bustling port cities. It is hard not to notice the issues facing our coasts today. Pollution, development, a decline in the fisheries, and conflicts over space. Who should be involved in solving these problems? Integrated coastal management has been suggested by Canada's Department of Fishery and Oceans as a way forward. This means bringing different coastal groups together to make decisions on how best to develop and protect our coasts. Based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, the Coastal Cura is a group of academic and community partners. Their goal is to identify how communities can play a stronger role in integrated coastal management. The ultimate goal of what we'd like to see happen is that coastal uh, residents, people living on the coast, are better involved in decisions about managing the coast. Cura members come from all over the Maritimes. There are three First Nation community groups, two fishing associations, two university partners, and a marine resource center. Being able to connect up, come to the table together and talk about the issues that we're uh, all facing, the, they may be environmental, uh, economic, social and cultural issues, we really have to talk about those and try to reach some some agreements. Although it is difficult and time consuming to have all of these stakeholders at the table, I think that building consensus has long-term benefits. The reason being that everybody has the opportunity to contribute. What are communities doing to protect their coasts and what is important to them? Here are four stories from Cura Partners, coastal groups who have been working to address specific problems within their community. Bear River First Nation. Bear River First Nation sits between two small rivers, the East Branch and the West Branch. Only a few decades ago, these rivers were an important source of food for local residents. Talking to the elders, the old stories were how most of these brooks around here could be walked across without even getting wet because you were walking on so many salmon. However, over the past few decades, the number of Atlantic salmon has decreased due to overfishing and habitat loss. In response, the Bear River community supported the development of a river restoration and habitat committee. Part of their funding was provided by Coastal Cura. Mainly we're trying to get the river back into its natural state. As you can see, it's over widened, and they determined that it's like supposed to be five feet instead of 14 feet. So we're trying to bring that back into the natural way it used to be. Originally, these rivers were deep and narrow, with small pools for fish and other aquatic species to lay eggs. However, in the early 1900s, lumber became a primary industry in Canada, and these rivers were used for log driving. Many of the surrounding trees were cut down, and without the tree's roots to keep the banks intact, the sides would erode into the water. This widened the rivers and made them very shallow. To restore the river, the first step involves moving the large rocks to one side. Next, deflector logs can be placed on an angle from the river's edge to prevent erosion and to shape the river into a narrower channel. Digger logs, which are placed across the river, can be used to create a small waterfall, which hollows out the river bottom below, creating the perfect place for salmon to lay their eggs. We actually electrofished it and found uh, juvenile salmon. When the salmon come in and did their spawning, they actually make a red, it's called, and it, it actual a uh, nice size hump in, in the bottom of the bed so that we knew that it wasn't man-made or it wasn't the water pushing the rocks around. It was an actual fish that did her spawning, which really made us feel good because our work was actually working for them. Working for the restoration project is important to me because I'm a fisherman, I'm a hunter, and when you start seeing salmon pars and, and the odd adult salmon, you, you get excited and you know you know what you're, the work you're doing is doing is it's 
what you should be doing. However, Cura members have learned that some coastal groups don't fully recognize the value of this project to the community. For example, Nova Scotia Power has built large dams without fish ladders, and local aquaculture companies have not addressed the issue of farm fish escaping upriver. Opal is Bubba's daughter, and she recently joined the Habitat and River Restoration Committee. It'd be nice to actually have salmon here like they used to years ago, but uh, there's been so much damage done and now it needs to be fixed a lot. If we want coastal communities to thrive, then the values of local people must be respected and their efforts to protect the environment should be supported. I haven't been able to go salmon fishing and I'd love to. We should have this in there for a couple of years. Hopefully you guys can come back and maybe you'll be able to go fishing here and catch some fish. The Mi'kmaq Confederacy of Prince Edward Island. Lennox Island is a Mi'kmaq community located on the shores of Malpec Bay in PEI. Here, local residents are making strong efforts to protect the health of the bay and their fisheries. The community currently manages a food fishery, which has existed for thousands of years, and a growing commercial fishery. We started fishing back for 10 years ago. People were saying, wow, look, we have the right to go out there and fish. What are we doing? You know? So I guess it started then. The connection between those who work on land and those who work on the water is well understood by community members. The management of the rivers and forests can affect the health of the coastal ecosystem and vice versa. Therefore, residents also practice sustainable forestry and maintain a natural sewage treatment plant. We don't have any septic systems here on, on Lennox Island. We have four pumping stations that pump all the effluent from all the community to this pond. Altogether, there are seven different areas that filter all this water till eventually it empties into the bay, which is pure water. Here on Lennox Island, we can see how important it is for different groups of people to talk about their shared environment. Malpec Bay. Randy Angus works for the Mi'kmaq Confederacy of PEI, a not-for-profit organization. As director of MCPEI's Integrated Management Department and a member of the Coastal Cura, he is interested in bringing together all of the groups that share the Malpec Bay coastline. The first and most important step to um, the management plan was to identify who the stakeholders were, who the partners would be, who the uh, different players would be. And we did that through uh, working with Cura and uh, a master's student from Dalhousie University. My research is directed towards uh, creating an integrated coastal zone management plan for the Malpec Bay. I would say the groups that are most aware about their interactions would be the agriculture, the aquaculture, and the fishery sector in particular. After explaining the concept to them, they were very keen on the idea and uh, saw it as a possible uh, way for the future for um, Malpec Bay. The Integrated Management Plan is an ongoing project. The idea is to bring together all of the groups that exist within the Bay's many watersheds and talk about coastal management issues. Some of these groups include Parks Canada, Recreational Fishers, and Watershed Residents. There are a number of different groups. The challenge is that the provincial and federal governments are not interested in including all of these groups in decision making. Yet, if we want to develop management plans that benefit everyone and address important local issues, solutions need to come from the ground up and involve all of these coastal groups. The Fundy North Fishermen's Association The coast of southwest New Brunswick is an ideal location for both the inshore fishery and aquaculture development. This has led to conflict between the two industries. The inshore fishery has existed here for many generations. Fishermen and women own small boats and multi-species licenses. The aquaculture industry 
was introduced to the Bay of Fundy in the 1970s, and the largest company today is Cook Aquaculture. For the 13 years that I've been working with the fishing industry, I would say that the uh, working relationship has been poor between the fishing industry, the aquaculture industry, and the government. You may use a cove sporadically for various types of fishing, like herring shutoffs or scallop dragging or whatever, and if an aquaculture site goes in there, then uh, you can no longer pursue that fishery. Selecting sites for new aquaculture cages has been a major issue in southwest New Brunswick. One particular area of concern is Macy's Bay. The whole Macy's Bay area is uh, very important ecologically and we are concerned about putting uh, too many aquaculture sites in there until we get a better understanding uh, of how an aquaculture site works in a, in a sensitive area. Lobster has supported coastal communities for generations. For thousands of years, it has been an important food source for the Passamaquoddy and Maliseet First Nations. The commercialization of lobster came later, and the industry continues to support many families. In the 1970s, the aquaculture industry was introduced to this area, and it began to grow. As the number of cages increased, fishermen lost more and more fishing ground. As a result, they are now fishing in deeper waters. They have also lost a number of their traps to passing aquaculture boats, as the boat propellers cut the lines and buoys off the traps. The coastal waters of southwest New Brunswick are becoming quite crowded, and as a result, conflicts arise. Today, fishermen are greatly concerned about the pesticides used to kill the parasites on caged fish. The chemicals that kill sea lice also kill lobsters, and we as a fishery have great concern uh, about the use of these chemicals. There were three significant lobster kills this fall, fishermen finding dead lobsters in their traps, um, and Environment Canada tested the lobsters and found the presence of cybermethrin, which is um, a powerful toxin known to kill lobster um, that also kills uh, sea lice very effectively. To bring together members from the fishing and aquaculture industries, the Department of Fishery and Oceans created a working group. The goal was to discuss important issues collectively. At these meetings, the aquaculture industry stated that they were interested in pursuing alternatives to the harmful pesticides. However, today, harmful pesticides are still being used on cage sites, and the fishermen have withdrawn from the meetings. Until we come to the place where we're having honest dialogue, uh, uh, I can't see things changing. Developing management plans should begin with addressing local conflicts. To date, this conflict remains unresolved. You know, I hope that we can resolve this uh, chemical issue. I hope we can find uh, a way of protecting the salmon from these uh, uh, parasites and diseases uh, that doesn't involve chemicals that we can move on to the uh, long-term plans for these communities and this bay. The Marine Resource Center For over a century the Annapolis Basin in Nova Scotia has supported a very productive clam fishery. Here, there are many beaches that are ideal habitat for clams. However, over the past few years, several factors have led to a decline in the population and an increase in beach closures. These closures are due to pollution, red tide, or the overflow of the town's wastewater treatment plant. Since the 1980s, with the help from the Marine Resource Center, the clammers have made requests to the municipal, provincial, and federal government to improve the plant and prevent the overflows. Instead, the government began leasing the closed beaches to a private company, Innovative Fishery Products. When the wastewater overflows from the plant, it washes up on the beaches, and the beaches are closed. IFP owns a depuration plant, a facility that cleans the fecal coliform from shellfish. The ability to depurate allows the company to gain leases and hire clamors to harvest on closed beaches. 
This means that clamors who have worked independently for generations must now either work for a company or watch as beach after beach is closed to clamming. When they close for, for a spill, uh, there's too many guys forced into an area. There's no compensation for us, so we, you know, we pretty much have to work. One of the best places to dig on the north side of the basin is Thorns Cove. Normally like four to six people digging in that cove, and I count at 58. Going from six to 58, you're taking like 10 times a man out in one day than what's normally done. So I mean, your stocks just can't handle it. We wind up uh, not being able to uh, do our jobs because there's nowhere to dig, or there's too small an area to dig, or we have to travel too far to dig and it doesn't make it pay. I mean, like you take $2,000 off of your income, that's an extreme amount to be taken away from a poor man. And we need to have some people start recognizing it and put a, a positive spin on it instead of shooting us down and taking our livelihood away from us at every stroke of the pen. Just a lowly old clam digger Hard work on the speed he's done Some people say, why are you fighting for that? You don't make hardly any bit of money. You're free. All we need to build this industry are beaches that are open and a little bit of leeway to be able to manage yourself. In the States, they do have uh, things set aside for uh, displaced fishermen. We've had nothing. Unless they have people that's actually in the industry telling them like how the flash is changing and stuff like that, they'll never know exactly what's going on. And if you had government people that would talk stuff out and take our knowledge and go to the next step, it would be tremendous in our industry, but it ain't happening. They think deparation is the answer, and I don't think it is myself personally. Why even bother going after the point, uh, the point source of pollution if uh, you can just depurate it and, and you don't have to put any money towards it? The way I look at it, government's trying to phase us out because we're independent. They did it with the fishermen, they did it with the Scot, they're doing it with the Scot guys now and the lost fishermen. Clean everything up and if you could have a poster say all our beaches are clean, you can dig anywhere you want, I think that'll bring more tourists and it'll better for the economy, better for everybody. And when you look after your industry and your environment, then everybody else is better off as well. They have to start listening. We have to, I mean, like, we give us a list. Look, we have a listening stick. Actually, here's one right here. All right. I think the Coastal Cure has been very effective in suggesting some ways forward. The first thing I think is that we acknowledge that communities have to be empowered to be involved in integrated management. The second step I think is that there has to be respect for community values in developing policy around um, management of natural resources that communities rely on. The third step I think um, we all agree on is that we have to create legal space for institutions for integrated management that include and empower communities and we have to create those um, at a number of different scales. And so the final step is that integrated management has to be happening at a number of different scales at the same time, locally, regionally, provincially and at the state level. Uh, it's a matter of trust. People have to be able to trust each other in order to let their guard down and really tell each other what they think. And only when that happens will you get creative social learning and creative solutions to problems. Mm -hmm.